Hi all and welcome to lecture 17 on theories of extremism. Uh, my name is Kelly Elliott and I'm a principal lecturer here at the Department of Law and Criminology. Uh, within today's lecture we are going to be looking at this idea of conceptualising what extremism is, trying to understand some of the key areas around it but also to begin to consider the impact. I also just want to take some time just to acknowledge that I appreciate that this probably wasn't the way that you were thinking about getting lectures from myself around extremism and this idea and concept of extremism and terrorism and that we are facing sort of an unprecedented period. Uh, however, what I'm hoping is over these next three weeks that we can give you enough understanding and knowledge around the subject of extremism. Uh, I'm going to be taking the uh, seminars following this week. Uh, which are going to be focusing on extremism and terrorism and going to get you to do some interactive activities so that you can still engage. What I'd also say, going back to contact details, if you have got questions about anything in any of the lectures or any of the materials that I'm sharing, please do get in contact with me via this email address. And of course, I will try and get back to you and help you guys out as much as possible. Uh, Given that we are in a context of things changing, what I thought it'd be interesting to do is also make you aware that it's not just us that are having to think about our safety. Uh, this is and isn't a April Fool for those of you that are thinking. This was actually posted yesterday, that's Sunday the 15th of March, in the Times newspaper around the fact that ISIS have issued coronavirus travel advice to terrorists. Uh, so not just us thinking about our safety, but ISIS terror group have told people to steer clear of Europe because of the coronavirus. So having previously urged its supporters to attack European cities, the group is now advising members to stay away from the land of the epidemic. And they are putting out instructions for followers to cover their mouths when yawning and sneezing and to wash their hands regularly. And the militants have plenty of experience in covering their faces, though previously they did so to hide their identities when beheading hostages on camera. Uh, it is actually from the Al Naba newsletter, and the group refers to some of the guidance from the World Health Authority and the World Health Organization. I just thought in terms of context, it was quite an interesting one to get us all thinking. Uh, and we will be talking more about ISIS in a couple of weeks time when we look at Muslim and Islamic ex inspired extremism. So then to begin with, three important concepts that you will find are going to be referred to throughout these lectures that will be referred to throughout this period of teaching. And that is the concepts of radicalization, extremism and terrorism. Uh, what I will hope to do is basically make you aware of the differences between them and make you have a think around what they can mean what they mean for different terrorists and extremist groups, have a think around what it actually means to be and have radical views, but then have to think about going through a period of de-radicalisation and for us to think around what some of those concepts mean. So we will bring these up in the next few lectures. Probably most of the time you'll see them as the concepts just to remind you, but these three themes are the things that are going to run through some of the teaching on this subject. And again, what I just wanted to remind you of, which I know Jen and the teaching team have spoken to you about, is to still think about this continuum of connection and this golden thread when we're thinking about the subject of sex violence and extremism. So thinking about the waves of harm and hate crimes, as you will have been looked at and looking at how that works, we're thinking around those individual bodies. But when we're thinking about extremism, uh, and terrorism, I will be giving you some examples of those people that have acted alone, those people that can be classed as lone wolves when we're thinking about extremism and terrorism, but then also thinking around that group mentality and thinking around what that means to be part of a group, what it means to be part of something and have a sense of belonging and how that can influence people to act and behave in certain ways, but then actually thinking around populations. So when we're thinking around this continuum of connection and populations when it comes to the subject of extremism, we may be thinking of populations that could be at risk, but we could also then be thinking around those issues linked to those populations that feel that they are at risk themselves or that they have been treated differently and are marginalised from 
society and communities. So when we're thinking about that continuum, this is where we can think around the fact that sex violence and extremism have some of those golden threads and some of those issues and thinking around actually how victimisation can then be perpetuated through society and communities. So to carry on that thread in terms of thinking about the word work of Ignacy in terms of that hate crime continuum is to think around how hate crime can then transfer into this idea of an extremist ideology and Borgio and Witt and Pollock 2006 did some work on thinking around what the trajectory of victimization can be in terms of hate crime and Ignacy talks about that actually if we think around hate crime and hatred uh, consolidating the unconscious identification between victim and victimization it talks about the fact that if we thought around some of the forms that are listed on here so verbal abuse hate speech harassment vandalized vandalism criminal damage, personal attack, that actually, if we didn't open up this idea that hate crime is bigger, that actually hate crime could have been just this concept to extreme bigots. So thinking around actually that bigotry can be something that's big, and the fact that if not these forms of confrontation constitute hate crimes. So we're thinking around how that idea of hate has developed, and thinking around actually the things that have changed in society so thinking more around the fact that we have a society that is more multi multicultural we have moved to a society that demands more around regulation and organizations in societies and that actually we can't just rely on this idea of everybody getting on everybody in a situation where we have a common goal and a common thread because people will say that actually social integration isn't as simple as it was. Actually, that common ethos, the purpose, isn't as reliable as it previously was. That isn't saying that that is something that's bad. Uh, that is how society has changed. And actually, what we've had to do is look at how we can change and adapt to some of those processes. So when we're then thinking around hate crime and how that develops into what we would class as extreme ideology is some of the examples that you can see on screen. So when we talk about extremism, actually what we're thinking around is that the hate develops and that extremism, thinking about that, that description of what something being extreme is, can go on to some of these nine areas that are listed. So we think around some of those areas of fear, creating fear within society, creating fear around how people think we think about malicious communication and we'll give you some more examples of this when we're looking definitely at left right wing extremism groups and also around islamic extremism but thinking around then how bribery and extortion public protests some of the vandalism personal violence can happen happen but also to think around how some of those behaviors can be glorified and we'll look through in the next two weeks of some of those examples and how the media can glorify some of that behaviour. So I'm going to take you to some of the definitions that are used by the UK government that are part of both the Prevent Strategy and the Home Affairs Select Committee, but also thinking around some of the legislation that exists. So when we look at the definition of what extremism is, we're talking about this idea from the Home Office in 2011, but also the House of Commons 2012. Interestingly, even though we are in 2020, the definition hasn't changed and extremism is still seen as this vocal act of opposition to fundamental British values. And it is around thinking around respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. When we then look at the Terrorism Act in the year 2000, section one, talks around terrorism being the use or threat of action both in and outside of the UK. So thinking around these attacks that can happen at the British Army or British forces that are overseas, but they are designed to influence any international government organisation or to intimidate the public. So it's thinking about advancing a political, religious, racial or ideological cause. So have and hang on to this idea when we're thinking around these definitions of what we mean by ideological cause and we'll come back to some of this as we go through the groups specifically that we're going to focus on.
So when we're thinking about defining terrorism, Richardson in 2006 looked at the fact that it is a controversial and difficult issue. And when we're thinking around terrorism, and when you and me may think about terrorism, we think about the attacks that have happened, especially in the last two, three years, but especially over the last six, seven years. But actually terrorism has been around for a number of years and a number of centuries. But also the thing that actually there isn't this international consensus of a, def of a definition. So if you were to look at some of the different countries, have a look at what the uh, UN states, actually there are some different definitions in terms of what they think. And that, as Schmidt and Jongman state, that this definition isn't objective, but it's about it being a social construct. Uh, I really do like the quote that's on here around one man's terrorist is the other man's freedom fighter. And for those of you that are interested, if we think around the work and the plight of Nelson Mandela, or even Osama bin Laden, as we will see when we look at Islamic extremism in a couple of weeks, actually, it all depends on who's doing the defining and what happens. And Richardson does a lot more work on that if you're really interested in thinking around some of those defining points. So why does it matter when we think around defining terrorism and why is it important to think around these things? So have a look at some of these examples on here. I'm not going to go through them all, but it will come as no surprise having had experience myself in working in a criminal justice agency around terrorism and extremism. Actually, how and what gets defined has massive policy and legal consequences implications. And actually what happens can have impact on how resources are allocated and planned. So if we reflect on the risk of terrorism in the UK, but especially here in South Yorkshire, the resource allocation for Sheffield is a lot more financially motivated than somewhere like Doncaster, for example. And that is because Sheffield is seen as a more high risk community. Uh, that from people that are living in the community and also from those that are traveling and settling in those communities. And we'll talk a little bit more around interventions and local uh, counter-terrorism plans in the coming week, but I'll try and share some of that information and knowledge around that with you. Actually, when we think around how we define it, we think around that implication of the Human Rights Act. So thinking around some of those rights, uh, we'll talk next week around some of those rights to protest, uh, rights to freedom of speech, thinking around some of those areas, and also to draw in how the media frames some of these areas of impression. Uh, we'll reflect a lot on some of the recent attacks and also the attacks uh, to 9-11 and how people have been referred to, etc. Uh, also about thinking around some of those legitimacy arguments when we're thinking about counter-terrorism, but also how people are viewed as being legitimate and the causes that they support. Uh, so one that we'll touch on next week is Extinction and Rebellion uh, and how their behaviour has been formed and seen within the communities and within the government, but also about some of the legitimacy of responses. Uh, and we'll try and take a bit of time to think about John Paul Men Menezed, who, for those of you that aren't aware, was killed uh, by the police at a time when there was a lot of pressure around the fact that they thought he was going to uh, cause a terrorist attack. But thinking around some of those areas. What's also really important to think about is this lack of definition around future, future terrorism. Uh, we're going to spend some time thinking around the contest strategy, which is the UK's current approach to dealing with terrorism and especially thinking around it's split into four P's, especially thinking about the impact of the prevent agenda. Uh, my previous experience when it comes to thinking around extremism and terrorism uh, was working closely uh, with the criminal justice agency around the prevent agenda. And there's some really interesting thinking and discussions around that. So thinking about the focus that we're going to think around when we're thinking around extremism, we are going to look at the three main focuses. So we're going to spend some time thinking around, and this will be next week, uh, the right wing extremist view. Uh, as you can see in here, we've done it in blue. And a lot of this is normally associated with the racist view. Uh, 
uh, around right wing extremist ideology and it's around this reaction against perceived threat loss of superiority so always promoting publicly and sometimes promoting violence so thinking about uh, groups like the English Defence League, uh, thinking his way back to uh, the BNP, the so British National Party, uh, and thinking around actually what some of those traits are around masculinity, thinking around how those people can be portrayed. Uh, and we'll look at some real good examples, both locally, nationally and internationally. Uh, and I'll use some of my experience to talk to you around what happened in Rotherham following the child sexual exploitation scandal and how the EDL, English Defence League, uh, were very prevalent within Rotherham and the impact that that had. We'll also then spend some time next week looking at the left wing view, which is the utilitarian view. And as Bentham said, even as far back as the 1700s, it's about the greater good for the greatest number. And the left wing view is thinking around liberty, equality and ethics through promoting publicity and sometimes violence. So when we think about some of the left wing groups, we'll be thinking around uh, protests, we'll be thinking around groups around uh, animal rights, thinking around places to do with uh, health, well-being, buildings, economy, environmentalism, and we'll have a look at a few of those areas. Then the final week before Easter, we'll be having a look at the Islamic view of extremism. And we're thinking around that promotion of a distorted interpretation of the religious scripture. So thinking around actually this ideological way of life and actually how the writings of the Quran and the views of what Allah determines can be seen to promote violence, uh, killings uh, and ensuring that the Islamic view is that of which is more superior to those of different areas. A lot of what we'll talk about when we think about the Islamic view of extremism thinks around the influence of government, thinks around uh, policy, thinks around how some of those areas have been developed, but then just to think around how this can be impacted both nationally and internationally. So what we need to think about and just to put into a bit of a context is how the political ideology and political landscape can impact on the understanding of left, right and centre views. So you will see on here from some of the views and some of the pictures, you will have a continuum. So if we go from the extreme right, we have this extreme right view of fascism. And some of the areas, and we, when we think about some of the ideals and people in there, you have Hitler. Hitler, regardless of what you say, had a fascist view around the extreme right and the treatment of individuals within Nazi Germany and how that can be seen as the preservation of hierarchy and superiority. So when we're thinking about this extreme right view, actually the extreme right view has been prevalent in society for a number of years and a number of centuries. Uh, coming back to current time, we think around the work and what Tommy Robinson gets up to, and we'll talk a lot more about Tommy Robinson in the coming weeks. We then go further into the right view, which can be seen as the conservative view. As you see, put some famous conservative leaders up there, from David Cameron, Margaret Thatcher, Theresa May, to our current Prime Minister and Home Secretary, Boris Johnson and Priti Patel. And if we think around some of those political ideological views and impacts of the right view, we can think around some of the policy changes, some of the impacts on sentencing, for example. Uh, so we're going to spend some time reflecting on what happened in London uh, at Fishmongers Hall involving Usman Khan and think around the response of the Conservative government to those offenders who are currently serving terrorist offences and sentences and how the government has reacted to that. We then come into the centre and we have that liberal view and in there we've had the previous and current leader of the Liberal Democrat Party but thinking around that centre ideology and that central view of society and how that ideology can be seen to be sometimes non-confrontational can sometimes be seen as not really making a decision for what we want in society and can sometimes be seen to be trying to please everyone, but that liberal view. Uh, 
We then move back into the left and thinking around socialism and labour. Uh, Tony Blair is on there. It uh, has to be when we're talking about extremism and ideology and impact of governmental policy when we think about the Iraq war. And then I have put Jeremy Corbyn up there. So even though Corbyn will no longer be the Labour leader from the 4th of April, we think about how Corbyn has been seen to be a left socialist, but actually some people would see him as veering into that extreme left communism bracket. So then finally, thinking around the extreme left, we have Karl Marx up there, who is best known not as a philosopher, but as the revolutionary around uh, the thinking and historical materialism. So Marx's theory of history and centred around the idea that forms of society rise and fall as they further and then impede the development of human produ productive power. So thinking around actually those class struggles, uh, he talked about this analysis of capitalism based on his version of the labour theory of value. Uh, lots of different work then in a time in Germany, uh, but really influential if we think around the communist movement. You've then got Vladimir Lenin, uh, and Vladimir Lenin, again, Russian revolutionary politician, and he served as head of the government of Soviet Russia in 1917-24 and of Soviet Union from 1922 to 20, 1924. Uh, he was well known for saying the goal of socialism is communism and fascism is capitalism in decay. Uh, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. So thinking about that communist view, uh, he was also famous in stating when there is a state, there can be no freedom. When there is freedom, there will be no state. So extreme left and going into left is about that preservation of liberty and equality. So it's really important to try and think when we're gauging this understanding of what we mean by extremism and terrorism, to think about how these political ideologies influence what happens, how government legislation and policy is developed, but also how terrorist groups can respond to and react to different changes within society as a result. The left wing then, we're thinking more about the socialism impact as well. So thinking around that socialism is an ideology that's defined by its opposition to capitalism. Uh, Hayward talks about the equality and cohesion and that collect collectivism, not individualism, is really important. And goes back to thinking around Durkheim's mechanical society. So for those of you that are really interested in that left wing view, uh, hang on to some of this and we'll cover some more of this in the coming week. So thinking around this utilitarian extremist, uh, probably a bit of a stereotypical picture on there, but I think it's one just to think around. Actually, this util utilitarian extremist thinks around actually how it probably started very much as this hippie movement and thinking around how the movement of people being against the state, thinking around being against eco economy, thinking about actually being social. So some of those ideas around pro-multiculturalism and thinking around actually this idea of equality and pro-freedom is really important when we think around this extremist group. Uh, and one group who I did some work with within South Yorkshire was looking at Unite Against Fascism, uh, who were a direct response uh, to some of the right-wing movements and thinking around that. We then just want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this centrist liberalism. So liberalism is this political ideology whose central theme is a commitment to the individual uh, and it's about this idea to be rational, free and have justice and toler toler tolerance within society, excuse me. Uh, so Hayward did a lot of work thinking around what that centrist view would be and something to think around. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the attacks by Usman Khan uh, did lead a lot of people to react to and the government's reactions to the killing of Jack and Saskia, who were both working on a programme uh, that is addressing and working with those within the prison system. Uh, to be looking at their views, their offending, but working alongside other people, uh, university students going into the prison system. And 
it was viewed that because of what Usman Khan had done, and we'll talk a lot more about this in the coming weeks, that there was an idea that he was de-radicalised, that he was now a member of society, uh, but that we needed to be aware of what the areas were and risks were. And what the uh, centrism and the electoral politics of terror talks about is that centrism has enabled and continued to enable the rise of the far right. So what centrism is enabling is that the far right view can still be exploited so that it's evident from the openly white supremacist social media users who use classical liberal in their bio and from the endless stream of Islamophobic and alt right columns on free speech that the centrist imaginary shapes how the police think about their responsibilities to protect political actors from terrorism. So what this is talking about is actually that because liberalism is about everyone is that actually it's actually placed specifically into the hands of the political right. So what it means is, is by not making hard decisions, actually when acts of terrorism like this one happened, actually it means that the far right can turn around and go, yes, this was wrong, uh, we shouldn't be allowing free speech, etc. So it's a good it's a good article for you to think around and have a look. So now moving on, thinking around this right wing conservatism view. So conservatism, as Haywood again defined by the desire to conserve and is reflected in a resistance to or at least suspicion of change. As humans, we hate change and as societies, we hate change. So this idea of having this multicultural society, if we view what Haywood and others have said, is that right wing conservatism is an absolute response to this change in society. So it's thinking around these ideas of conservative ideology or tradition. It's around this society and authority and property being by those that possess it. So thinking about white middle class men. Uh, it's thinking about traditional positions within society and traditional groups. And these are institutions and practices that have been tested by time and should be preserved. So this is about thinking around, if you have been exposed to people in your family that have said, well, we always do it this way, this is the way we should do it, that's quite a right-wing conservative view. Again, there's some developments in Durkheim's work from Organic Society to reflect upon this. But when we think about those examples, it's about being able to maintain hierarchy. It's around us having this white society that is Christian and heterosexual and anything against that is a risk and a threat. So if you look at some of these images on here, we have the British National Party. Uh, one of the marches a number of years ago, as you can see on there, is Britain is full up. So very much a number of issues around immigration. So the four years of Brexit and negotiations have had a massive impact when we think around this right wing rash, uh, racist element. We then think around the English Defence League and some of the national action groups, and it's thinking around some of those differences in society, so multiculturalism, uh, different areas, uh, no more mosques. So when I was working in Barnsley, there was a campaign to open a mosque in that area, and that was turned away and rejected. So think around some of those areas and some of those campaigns. And I'll reflect a bit more upon the issues within Rotherham with the child sexual exploitation scandal and how the English Defence League reacted as we move to look at right wing extremism. So just to take us back then, just to think around some of those other areas and some of those other types and relations to the three types of extremism that we're going to look at. So right wing again. So thinking again, it's this authority based on racial and sexual hierarchy. So thinking around some of those reactions against perceived threat and loss. So thinking around actually how they can be related to how this publicity and promoting of violence can happen. So when we're thinking again about, say, for example, the English Defence League, you will see a lot of the time they did a lot of marches to try and gather momentum, get people involved, think around what happened. Uh, and we'll talk about what some of that rights protest, but that mentality of that group dynamic does in terms of those areas. Uh, again, thinking around that, seeking to promote liberty, equality and ethics for that left wing group. Uh, and finally, thinking again around religious 
Islamic ideology. So a little bit more thinking around this religious ideology. It's that rule of law. Uh, have no conception of life. So for thinking around Islamic extremism, when we think around this conception of life, actually what this talks about is when we think around and have a lot of discussion around this idea of the rewards from committing terrorist acts and suicide bombers and thinking around actually what that happens. So we're thinking around afterlife, we're thinking around what, what is beyond this current living and this being, uh, but thinking around some of these areas. And when we think about religious and Islamic extremism, uh, we talk about this fact that it is indiscriminately targeting. So this means that it isn't always just about targeting a specific person or group. Actually, it's indiscriminate. So actually anybody could be involved and it's around leaving few clues. So think around leaving few clues around being detected, thinking around actually unless they take a stance and say that they have committed that offence. So actually own up or do that for that honour based killing. So thinking around some of those areas that actually it is very hard to be aware of which group that could be. When we look at Islamic extremism and this religious ideology in a couple of weeks time, what we're going to think around is some of these four facilitating factors and thinking around how some of these can impact. So we talk about this idea of an unresolved regional dispute. So we'll think around some of the literature around this, but it's about having a dispute. It can be known as having a grievance. So you can have a grievance about a act that may have happened, uh, something that's happened within your country or your area, uh, your grievance being treated differently, uh, that can then lead on to having an extremist ideology. So it can lead on to the fact that you may feel that you're a victim, you're treated differently, uh, and some of these areas aren't just about being pure to Islamic extremism, they can be facilitating factors for all extremist activities, but actually this unresolved regional dispute or about the country, government, etc. is more prominent and prevalent when we're thinking around religious ideology. So this ideology that is developed by this pull on radicalisation. So what I want you to think about is we all may be angry about something. You could be quite angry that you're not in university at the moment and that you're having to listen to me at home uh, and that you have had disruption to your teaching. So we think about dispute, we think about the UCU action and we think around the fact that you could be angry around things happening. That doesn't mean being or having an extremist ideology will pull you to be radicalised actually we can all be angry about something it doesn't mean that you'll move on to commit action what we talk about is the fact that there are some individuals that have this pull of being radicalized and we will talk about what some of those pulls can be and how people can be impacted that could be mental health that could be learning disability and i'll give you a few case examples in the coming weeks around this but then that pull of radicalization one of the then fourth and final facilitators is this impact of technology and this growth of technology, this ability to get information at your fingertips, this ability to engage in discussion, uh, be part of a group, be part of something has been developed and influenced by that technological uh, revolution. So the ability to find information, to be active on the dark web, for example, can lead to that technological impact. And you could be talking to somebody in another country that has a very different grievance that motivates you to take action. So when we're thinking around these four facilitators, when we're thinking around Islamic ideology, these four facilitators have to be present, but this again still does not mean that you will go on to commit an extreme effect. And we'll talk about how that develops and how that can be motivated. I want you just to think around this global terrorism impact. So this is taken from the Global Terrorism Index and looks at the impact of terrorism in the world. So what you will see is we've got very high to not included or not in there. And even though you can see the UK and Ireland in there is in a medium colour, look at the other colours, col countries that there are in very high and high. So we're thinking about impact of terrorism in international states. We're thinking around that impact in territories that we are probably not hearing as much about on the news. So we still think around the impact of terrorism in places like 
uh, Afghanistan, we still think about the impact of terrorism on some of those international places. So when we think about the impact at home and the threat from the UK and Europe and terrorist groups being asked to come abroad to commit those offences, actually we still are within that medium and low territory and impact. And what we will think about in these coming weeks is what impacts that, what are the push and pull factors, how that can be motivated and what can also be influencing or decreasing those risks. We'll also think around how policing can impact on this and some of the decisions around policing uh, and security services, etc. On here, you will see the references of some of the materials that I've used. What I would recommend as a starting point is having a look at some of the strategies. So for any of you that have already done your first assessment on extremism and an extremism policy, some of you may be very familiar. But a really good starting point is looking at some of the House of Commons papers. So the Roots of Radicalisation Policy, the Prevent Strategy, uh, but also thinking around some of the uh, hate crime global perspective pieces. So what we're going to do next is move on to the next lecture. If you do have any questions about the materials today, then please do get in contact with me. And thank you for taking the time to listen.